Hey, just a reminder, up until 1917, we were the Pentecostal Church of the Nazarene. Just saying, just saying. You may be seated this morning. I'm so thankful. You know, I sometimes get depressed for the people that aren't able to be here and experience the Holy Spirit. I I do. I, I tend to think to myself, man, you know what people miss when they get to experience what God wants to say to us. And the worship that we get to have and offer to him. We don't even have the ability to worship unless God gives it to us. He provides opportunities for us to worship him, both in word and in deed. So, we've been reading the Bible together as a, as a congregation. We started in Luke, we're now in Acts. The tie together is that Luke wrote the book of Luke and Acts. And uh, we're at chapter a day. So this past week, we've read chapters 9 through 14. And again, I want to encourage you, don't try to catch up, okay? We we want you to join us in reading. I'm so thankful for many of your comments and uh, responses to the daily readings on the uh, WeBelieve2016.org site. Uh, Many of you have commented that you've really been enjoying them. Thank you, because those are a labor of love for me. Um, I keep telling people, and especially my wife, I'm not doing this for you. Uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, You might benefit from what God is doing in me, but the reality is I'm doing it for myself. Um, I I, I constantly, whenever I open God's word, I diligently pray, and you'll hear me say this often, God, I want you to reveal to me what you want me to hear today. And it's amazing what he does with scripture. And when when we allow him to really illuminate scripture for us, what you're seeing and reading is basically what God's doing in me. And so, uh, so I hope it's okay. I'm not doing it for you, uh, but hopefully you'll benefit from it. Amen? So, so this next week, we're going to start in chapter 15 tomorrow, and I want to encourage you to, um, to, to join us and uh, start reading one chapter a day. There's reading books in the back. There's also um, a chart in the back as well so that you can, you can mark off and follow along. <clears throat> so if you're looking at the story uh, this morning of the church, you might be kind of confused whether or not the church is being successful. And success is defined in many different ways, but at this point, we'd be torn to look at the early church and say, well, is this really successful? Because many people are being healed, and a lot of people are experiencing salvation in Christ, uh, but the reality is, too, a lot of the believers are getting beat up and killed, right? Right? Uh, And this is just kind of the nature of the church at this point. At this point in the story, we're going to read that James was just killed and Peter is now in prison. So I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, uh, we're going to focus on the story of Peter's miraculous escape. If you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, I encourage you to turn to page 841 so that you can also follow along. Did you bring the word with you? Um, uh, you know, I, I love it, uh, whether it's electronic form or, did, you know, uh, print form. Uh, my personal preference would be print form. I'm kind of like, I, I'm like old new school, right? Um, so I'm new school on some things, but old school on others. And uh, the reason why I like the print form is because of the things that you're going to bump into along the way. See, in the digital form, you're going to see what's right there in front of you, which is great. Don't get me wrong. But with the, with the print, we actually have the opportunity all of a sudden. In fact, um, um, uh, yesterday in our board meeting, we were reading out of Habakkuk chapter 2, and uh, one of the board members cheated. And I told them, let's respond to Habakkuk 2, and they were reading Habakkuk 1. And I said, wow, if you just had an electronic version, you would just read what I told you to read. But really, the important point was, because they saw a note somewhere else, The Holy Spirit utilized that, and our time together was so awesome because we bumped into something else that God was saying. That's why I love this book, what we bump into along the way. I digress. Acts 12. So at this point in the story, I'm just going to kind of catch us up to kind of save a little bit on time, and then we're going to we're going to just we're going to bulldoze forward. All right. So at this point, Peter's enchained. He's literally chained to two guards because he had already escaped once and they were like, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh. 
bro ain't doing this again. So he's chained to two guards, and he's sleeping. How you sleep between two guards being chained to a floor and two other people, I'm not sure, but he was sleeping. All of a sudden, there was this incredible bright light that filled that place, and Peter, now wrap your head around this, is sleeping, and an angel, like, punches him in the side. Or like, you know, or like, you know, elbows him in the side. Something happened. Peter was hit by an angel. Again, wrap your head around that. And Peter, like kind of in a, in a daze, is really confused about what's going on. We know he's confused. We expect him to be confused because, I mean, he's seen God do the miraculous before. He's seen angels rescue him before. But this time is a little bit different. This time the angel had to com- remind him, hey, buddy, put on your sandals, Right? And you know what else he said? He said, hey, put on your coat too. So the angel's reminding Peter that he needs to get dressed. The coolest thing about that is not that Peter forgot how to get dressed. What the angel was communicating is, you're not staying here anymore. Your destination is out of here. So I want you to get up and I want you to get dressed. I want you to be ready. We're leaving. So at that point, Peter then goes past two sets of guards. You know, we don't know if they were like, you know, These are not the droids you're looking for, right? We don't know what's going on there, if they were asleep or if they were just in a daze themselves. But either way, the angel took Peter out, and he took them through two sets of guards, two sets of gates. The final gate he had to get through was the iron gate that led to the city. It was the most massive, the the hardest, roughest gate in all of the town that was going to lead out to the city. And all of a sudden, as they're making their way down the hall, what happens? Miraculously, that gate is opened up. Come on. That's cool stuff. That's cool stuff, right? And so this is where we pick up the story. Acts 12, verse 12. It says, when he realized this, he went to the home of Mary. Now, when he says when he realized this, Peter was walking with the angel, and all of a sudden the angel left him, and Peter, kind of maybe because of the air outside or the fresh air or maybe it was the cold breeze, whatever, he finally like, kind of like came to like, whoa, wait a minute. This isn't a dream. This is actually happening, Right? And uh, so he leaves, and then when he realizes it, verse 12 here, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, uh, where many, listen, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, because the first thing you do is say, who's there, right? When she recognized Rhoda's, or when Rhoda recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door, right? Listen, you can't read this any other way. You, you, Peter is standing at the door. It doesn't work. Peter's standing at the door, and what did the people say? Inconceivable, (laughs) right? inconceivable. There's no way. In fact, they literally believed that she was out of her mind, that she had gone crazy. They said, you're out of your mind. When she insisted, they decided it must be an angel. Now, truth be told, the people during this time, that would have been a common thought. They would have thought, in fact, at that point, they would have been in almost a little bit of twinge, a starting of mourning. Because if if Peter's angel was standing outside the door, that means he was already dead. But that's not the way that they prayed. They didn't pray that way. Meanwhile, verse 16, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, Peter is still knocking at the door. (laughs) Well, wouldn't you? You just escaped from prison. I mean, I'm telling you, if I'm standing in front of a door and I'm like, they're after me, they're after me. I need somebody to open the door here. You know what I mean? Rhoda's like, ah! She goes back, and they're all like, inconceivable. You know, and, and Peter's still, hello. I don't know how long I have here, folks. I need to get in there. Stand at the door knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. They were amazed. He had to motion to them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led them out, how the Lord had led him out of prison. He said, tell James and the other brothers what happened. He said, and then he went to another place. This is, this is exciting and comical all wrapped into one. This is one of the most exciting and the most comical stories, maybe in all of scripture, but I know at least in in the book of Acts. 
It's exciting because Peter was literally prayed out of prison by a diligent, faithful, praying church. That's amazing. That's exciting. And it's comical because this praying church didn't believe that God had actually answered their prayers. Even when their answered prayer was standing at the door. So it's comical. They were like, uh, I don't think so. I mean, I know we're praying here, but really. Do you remember the last time that someone surprised you at the door? Do you remember how you felt being surprised by somebody who you didn't recognize or didn't, didn't expect to be there? Um, I love watching uh, military surprises and reunions. I mean, they get me every time. Because you know the emotion of that moment. You think about this, back in World War II, they, they did have, uh, the war office would send out people to notify the families when their loved one had perished or what died in war. But there were so many that were dying that they had to relegate it to the Western Union. And the Western Union would, couriers would bring notes and notices to those doors of those soon-to-be widows And so now there was a great fear. Every time there was a knock at the door, they were scared. They were afraid that they were getting news that they didn't want to get. And what's interesting is um, oftentimes, and I kind of looked at some stories about this, oftentimes the men would come home and as a kind of a cute prank, they would stand at the door and they would knock, you know, because they would love to see the reaction of their loved one opening the door and seeing them standing there. Well, of course, the servicemen didn't know that that knock was dreadful. That knock was, was so concerning. Anytime the doorbell rang or the, or the door was knocked on, those people in that family, they shuddered. And all of a sudden, they go and they open the door. And their father, their husband, their nephew, their son, or their niece was standing there. And, and you know the, the emotions that they go through, the first one is of shock. They can't believe it. And then there's a twinge. There's a split second of disbelief. Is this real? Is this really happening right now? And the last part where they get to is that overwhelmed with joy. And if you ever watch those those times when you see those videos, you can see them hugging, and they can't hug them hard enough. They can't touch them enough because the person that had been in their mind for a year or so was now standing right in front of them. So it's believed that there was probably close to 100 people in the house praying for Peter that day. Scripture tells us that they were so excited about the answered prayer that Peter had to settle them down. He's like, guys, don't blow it now, (laughs) right? Yeah, I escaped from prison, but you notice he didn't stay very long. He had to move. He had to keep going. He had to leave town. But he had to go and he had to tell the people because he knew he knew that there was a community of believers that were praying diligently for him. When was the last time that you were that excited for answered prayer? When was the last time that you got so excited because God had answered your prayer that you were just so amazed and overwhelmed that somebody had to say, whoa, wait, wait, guys, you need to settle down a little bit. You're a little out of control right now. When was that experience for you? Because Peter was an answered prayer. Peter was an answered prayer. Regardless of Peter's situation, regardless of his circumstances, circumstances, God answered the prayer of a righteous church that day. Peter may have been in prison, but the fervent prayer of a righteous church is powerful and effective. You see what I did there? See what I did there? James 5.16 tells us that the power, say this with me, the power of a righteous person is, yeah, is powerful. Our, the, the prayers, I'm sorry. The prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. I believe that we can, we can substitute person for church. That the prayers of a righteous church are powerful and effective. So for us, this story has as much to do with the power of prayer as it does with Peter's release from prison. 
And you need to know, you need to know, say this with me, what we pray for in here affects what happens out there. You've got to know that this morning. What we diligently pray for in here has impact and power to change what happens out there. I mean, the question that I immediately thought of when I was reading this and God just kept flooding it over me is, Steve, who do you want standing at the door? Who do you want standing at the door? You see, that's where this story becomes more personal. We recognize that a praying church and a, and, a, and, a, and a righteous church and a faithful church had prayed for Peter and he was released from a physical prison. But we have loved ones. We have co-workers we have friends, we have family members who might not be in a physical prison, but they are enchained by sin. They're enslaved. They're in a spiritual prison. And the question is, how hard are we willing to pray to see their release? How hard are we willing to pray to, to one day hear that knock at the door and to open the door and be absolutely amazed at what God had done through your prayers? How hard, church, how hard are we willing to pray? Peter was in a physical prison, but we know people who are in spiritual prisons. We see countries that are becoming more and more enslaved to the power of sin. And we have to realize that what we pray for them in here will affect what happens to them out there. What we pray for them in here will affect what happens to them out there. As we close this morning, I, I, have to, I have to make sure to say this because I don't want it to be lost in the message this morning. You may be sitting here as a result of someone else's prayer. You may be here this morning. There are no such thing as coincidences. You are here this morning because God wants to remind you that number one, he loves you. Number two, his grace covers you. And number three, it could just be because of a family member or a loved one or a friend who has prayed for you. That's amazing. That's amazing. There's a story that um, I'm very familiar with, and I've heard both sides of, from the father and I've heard from the daughter of this story. But I want you just to take a few minutes and I want you to hear the story of Jim Cimbala, who's the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church, just tell um, uh, the story of his daughter, Chrissy. And, um, and I pray, I pray that we can hear what God has intended for us to hear through this story this morning. Crying here when I mention my daughter. I happen to see your face. So that tells me that maybe I should leave on this note. You know, when I went through that two and a half year long nightmare with my daughter, I said this at dinner last night. One night at my lowest, my wife had a hysterectomy during that time. Hormonally, she got thrown off, estrogen levels. She started talking of not wanting to live anymore and taking her life. I'm pastoring a church, starting other churches, renting Radio City Music Hall. My daughter's not there. I cry through Christmas Eve. It's not easy. The Lord one night at about one o'clock in the morning, 1.30 on a Saturday night as I was praying, said, I'm gonna bring Chrissy back. He had stopped me talking to her for months and just said, you've tried manipulation, money, you know, when your daughter's drifting, you try to fix it. Do I get a witness here? You try to fix it, right? But God, you know, the, wor the harder I tried, the worse she got. I tried everything. Carol was going through her struggles. I thought I was gonna lose my mind at times, the grief of Chrissy, then my wife, not the woman I married any longer. After not talking to her for Five months. Knew she was in the city at this time in a Tuesday night prayer meeting. Someone sent a note up and said, I feel impressed we're supposed to pray for your daughter tonight. 
I waited, called an associate pastor at the appropriate moment, had him lead out in prayer. The church turned into a labor room. Ever been in the labor room? You know, their love for me, for Carol, their love for Chrissy, the Holy Spirit helping them. I didn't shed many tears that night because all my tear ducts were dry. You you cry so much, there's nothing left. I came home, my wife wasn't there. I came home, she was sitting at the kitchen table. She had a cup of coffee. I sat there, she said, how'd the day go? I said, it's over, Carol. She said, what's over? I said, it's over, Chrissy's coming back. She said, how do you know? I said, if there's a God in heaven, she's coming back. If you were there and heard them pray, it's over. Just about the next morning, I'm shaving. Carol bursts in the bathroom. She says, Chrissy's downstairs. I wiped the shaving cream off. Wait, I wiped the shaving, that means time out. Uh, I wiped the shaving cream off my eye, uh, off my face. I go downstairs and there's my beautiful daughter, model child grown up. She's on her hands and her knees, crying. I lift her up to me. The minute I saw her eyes, I knew she had changed. She was the girl that I remember. She said, Daddy, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against Mommy. I've sinned against myself. Who'd you have praying for me last night? I said, what do you mean, Chrissy? She said, just tell me, who'd you have praying for me? Well, we did pray for you. The church prayed for you. She said, because in the middle of the night, God gave me a dream, a vision. I saw myself going 95 miles an hour toward this abyss, and he caught me right on the edge. And instead of yelling at me, Daddy, he loved me, and he said he still cared for me, and he had a plan for my life. And now she's the wife of a pastor in Chicago, doing great work for the Lord, got the same gifting her mother has. Not trained, not trained, not trained, doesn't know what she's doing. She just keeps doing it every Sunday like my wife. God recovers stolen property. Here's one thing the Lord, I felt, say to me. Wherever I send you, where you feel prompted, you tell them what I did for your daughter. You tell them, I'm going to make you an example that God does answer prayer. Let's close our eyes quick. If you're here, you got a daughter. If you were there and heard the way that they prayed, if there's a God in heaven and you were there and heard the way that they prayed, he knew with confidence that it was over because a faithful, obedient, and a righteous church was on their knees and they were praying. And we don't know what the room sounded like that was praying for Peter. But I think it's safe to assume that it didn't, wasn't filled with silence or quiet meditation. I, I think that we can assume that it probably sounded like a delivery room. That they were giving birth that night to a prayer that was going to be heard by Christ. And then God sends an angel. And, and the, for us folks this morning, we've got to be diligent in praying, we've got to be on our knees. For some of us this morning, we've been on our knees. And there's probably times where we feel like it's time to get up. Don't get up. Don't get up. And I don't just mean physically on your knees. I mean just in the attitude and the heart and the emotion of prayer. There's going to be times where we feel like I just, I, I need to get up because I've, I feel like I've prayed all that I can pray. When you feel like you've come to the end of your prayer, pray again. Because we're tasked, just like the early church, we're tasked with the honor and the privilege to be able to bring and intercede on behalf of the Peters. To intercede on the behalf of loved ones who are far from God. We have been given that honor. We've been given that privilege. Church, this morning, 
Who do you want standing at the door? Who do you want to pray for right now because you desire to one day hear that knock? (laughs) And you too can be amazed at what God had done through your prayer. What God has done, he gets all the credit. We we don't have the ability to save anybody. But we sure have the ability to intercede. We sure have the ability to constantly, like the widow, taking um, uh, the persistent widow who, who went to God over and over and over and over again. We have that opportunity. So this morning as we close, in the time that we have left, I want you to do this this morning. This is going to be a little bit different. And Angie, I'm just going to ask if you'd come and just, just play for us. <clears throat> Many of you have been thinking about a person or persons while I've been preaching. Many of you have been thinking about the Peters in your life or the Chrissies. Many of you are just overwhelmed right now by this, the rawness of the Holy Spirit convicting you and convincing you that you need to be on your knees praying for them. I, I'm a firm believer, if you've been around me, even on like Wednesday night prayer meeting, folks, do you know that we have a prayer meeting? We meet every Wednesday night. We open the doors at 645 so that you can come and just be quiet before the Lord and prepare your heart. And at 7 o'clock, we gather together And we sing. And then there's usually, hopefully, a short devotional out of God's word. But then we gather together and we pray. Can I tell you that I can attribute a number of miraculous things that God has done at Trinity back to a Wednesday night? And anybody who's been there on a Wednesday night can attest to that. Because we want to be a church that's found faithful. We want to be a church that recognizes that what we do in here affects what happens out there. What we pray for in here affects what happens out there. Who we pray for in here will have an impact on the person out there. We want to be found faithful. We want to be a church that, that just gets blown away by seeing what God does through our prayers. We want to be a church where our, the person who comes in is like, whoa, 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 y'all need to just settle down a little bit. Because we're so excited about what God just did. So this is what I want you to do. If you're here this morning and, and um, if you're a, a couple with a lost child, would you just grab the hand of that person And would you pray for them right now? If you're here and you have a friend or a loved one that's far from God, would you just grab a couple of people around you? Again, I know that this is different. This is different. This is like audience participation at church. I know you didn't sign up for that. You're like, I came to listen, not do. But I want you just to get into some small groups just three or four, two. And I want you to just pray. And I want you to say the person's name out loud. That's really important to me. It's important because not because God is confused and he doesn't know who you're praying for, but because you then are committing it. What does it say that our prayers do? They, they get offered up and they become incense offerings. And they, they literally, God breathes them in. We're reading in the book of Acts that what does it say about the centurion, about the Roman official? It says, God heard your prayer and he saw your love for the poor. And there's power in prayer. So I'm going to stop. And I just want you, everybody, just to stand if you wouldn't mind. We're only going to take a few minutes. And I just want you to just kind of just huddle up. Just huddle up. And if there's somebody that you don't know, go ahead and start moving. If there's somebody you don't know, grab them. Grab them in. Extroverts, grab the introverts. Okay? Introverts, you're going to be okay. 
moms, dads, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents, you know who you need to pray for right now. Just grab hold of them. And let's just take a couple of minutes and we're just gonna close our service in praying together, okay? And it's okay if this place sounds like a delivery room because bold prayers honor God and God is honored by bold prayers or God honors bold prayers. So let's just pray now. Let's just pray.